All right, Terry Caliendo, Dedicated Managers. Back for another exciting edition, talking about OAuth 2.0, the authorization framework, the IETF spec 6749. Whew, that is exciting, huh? Um, in the last video, I did a video here, uh, understanding OAuth 2.0 directly from the IETF. This was meant to be more of a high level overview. And now I wanna start digging down into the actual RFC document. Um, I found it pretty difficult to read, but uh, it's actually not that bad once you once you understand it. So that's my goal with these is to help um, help you understand the RFC better, so that you can go right to the RFC whenever you have questions, rather than going to the internet, which seems to have a lot of um, back and forth information of people that really aren't really sure. They're just kind of saying things, but not necessarily backing up what they're saying by the spec. So before I get into that, I want to just talk about um, uh, this guy here. He does a, this is a great video. This is a guy that works for Okta. Um, his name is Nate Barbonetti. I think that's how you say his last name. This, look for this video. I'll put a link to it in the description. Um, this OAuth 2.0 and OpenID Connect in plain English. He does a great job of explaining uh, high level as well. And in that video, he um, this is that video again, um, he shows this image which is out there on the web on, on codinghorror.com and this was back in the day and this we're going to talk about this how it relates to the problem that the um, OAuth 2 framework is trying to solve so let's dig down in and see um, see where we're at here so I'm going to go down to the introduction and talk about uh, the introduction piece here so it starts out by saying uh, in the in the traditional client server authentication model um, the client requests an access restricted resource on the server by authenticating with the server using the resource owner's credentials. What does that mean? I mean, that's a typical login situation. When you go to a website and log in, you give it your username and password. But in order to give a third party application, so somebody else access to that first restricted resource that we just logged into back here, um, the resource owner has to again share their credentials with the third party. And that's what this image gets into here, is that back uh, a while back, before OAuth, um, before anybody was using it, maybe even before it was um, you know, uh, um, invented, um, I don't know about the dates exactly, but Yelp was trying to get um, you to send an email to all your friends to say, hey, come join me over on Yelp. Right, that was their brilliant marketing scheme back in the day. Basically spam, but uh, but le but legitimate because you allowed it from your address book. But Yelp wanted to make it easy rather than you sending all the emails yourself. Yelp said, "Hey, give us, tell us what your email service is. Give us the email address that you log in with and the actual password that you use to log in. We will log into your account programmatically for you and pull your contacts, and then we'll email your contacts for you." Um, and so by doing that, basically you were giving your password, your login and password, your credentials to a third party um, from, from your first party application. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about that as it relates to the RFC. So if we go back to the RFC here and look at what, it, um, what happens, this creates several problems and limitations. So this is a great overview. Um, Third-party applications are required to store the resource owner's credentials for future use, typically in clear text. And why is that? Well, Yelp is the third party. They're going to take my um, password here, your password, the user's password, um, and log into Gmail. And they might want to log in another time, you know, after your, your stuff is updated. This might be a one-time thing here that they were doing, but other services might want to keep it, um, you know, if they were accessing your calendar, say, on Gmail. Um, if Yelp was trying to access your calendar or a third party was trying to access your calendar, they would need to keep your password on file. And at that time, Gmail didn't really have an API for third parties to access um, your calendar, your stuff. Um, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but in this scenario, they didn't. Um, so the third party here would just create code that would log into the typical front end that you and I would log into manually, but the code would do it. And then the code would click the links and get to wherever it needed to do, virtually click the links and actually maybe just call the right pages. Um, but it was kind of a hack, I think, back then. 
Um, but in order to do that, each time they had to log in, they had to use your password. So um, they had to store it in plain text because if they encrypted it themselves with like a hash algorithm, they wouldn't be able to get it back to get it over to Gmail. You have, you have to actually type it in in plain text to Gmail. So um, they had to store it in plain text. So now you've got your password uh, stored in plain text on this third party so that they can use it to get back into your account at another time. Um, then servers are required to support password authentication despite the security weaknesses inherent in it. So, um, you know, they're, I, I think that's saying that, you know, this, again, this third party is, is having to support password authentication when, there, when there's another way to do it, as we're going to find out in the, in the um, spec. And then third party applications gain overly broad access to the resource owner's protected resources. So again, the resource owner is, is you know, this, the person, um, the resource owner is the person that's typing this stuff in. That's why he's got the credentials. Um, and, and they've got, so, so they're giving these credentials to, to Yelp, this third party. And now Yelp can go into Gmail and not only get your contacts, because that's all they're asking for here, but they could also get um, your calendar. I don't know if there was a calendar at the time, but if there was, they could get your calendar information. They could see your actual emails. Um, there was no restriction saying um, when you gave them this username and password, there was no way to restrict from, a, from Gmail's perspective or a third party's perspective to say, hey, Yelp, you know, you can only get my contacts. You can't actually get my, my actual emails. So, you know, don't go that far. Don't even try it. Um, so there's there's no you know they, they they have the actual first party credentials, your credentials, so they can just log in and do whatever they want uh, programmatically or however. There's no restriction and and making them held accountable. Now Yelp might be a good enough company that they wouldn't do that, but that's not to say that another third party might you know wreak some havoc or even worse you know Yelp uh, since they're storing your stuff in plain text you know if they get hacked somebody can, um, you know, get in and get your, your plain pat username and password, and, and now you're hacked over on Gmail. Even though Yelp got hacked, you just got hacked on Gmail because your password was there. Um, so that's kind of what this is trying to, to alleviate. Then the next one is that the uh, resource owner, uh, that's the person that typed in the credentials, uh, cannot revoke access to an individual third party without revoking access to all third parties um, and must do so by changing the password. Um, so in this situation, if I don't want Yelp to have uh, access to my account anymore, if I'm this person and I don't want Yelp to have access to this account anymore, I have to go and change my password at Gmail. Um, there's no other way to do it. I, I can't go and I mean, I could go and tell Yelp to erase my password, but who knows if they did. So there's no way for me to revoke access to them without going here to Gmail and changing my password. And now if I've also given my username and password to not just Yelp, but another service, um, you know, like draw.io, I showed in another one where they were saving stuff to my, my Google Drive. And, you know, if I have it out there, my username and password out on five different services, if one of those services gets leaked, um, you know, uh, um, that password, it, it's compromised to, it, it's, it's going to be compromised. So I've got five different ways for my, my credentials to get compromised. And again, if I'm on, if I've got it on my password on, on five different services and I change my password here at Gmail, um, it revokes access to all five of those services because they all use that same password to get in. And now that password is no longer valid. So it's really ugly. Um, and so that's why it, it, it died quickly. And, and, you know, this, this token mechanism or this mechanism that we're going to talk about uh, came into being. And then this last one, the compromise of any third party application results in a compromise of the end user's password and all the data protected by that password. So again, I just talked about that, that if you had Yelp and, and a bunch of other ones, um, and one of those gets uh, one of those gets hacked. Now your password, um, you know, you've got all those five different ways, all those different ways for your password to get hacked. And now um, it's just more more ways for your for someone to get to your account. So that's the um, you know that's the reasons why why we don't want to use the, the password thing. So what's the thing that we're going to do to to circumvent that or to to stop that problem? And so. 
OAuth addresses uh, these issues by introducing an authorization layer and, and separating the role of the client from that of the resource owner. This is where we start to get into terminology that makes it hard to read this. But the client, the client is not uh, me with the username and password. The client is the application that's trying to access that third party thing. And we'll talk about that when we get into the, um, the next section in the roles. Um, but basically what OAuth does is it creates a, a third party service out here that um, is now able to, to give and, and take away access by way of tokens. We'll talk about what those tokens are in later um, screen shares. But that third party can give a token to Yelp that Yelp can use with Gmail and, 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 and access only certain things. So this third party can give Yelp access to, to your Gmail contacts, but not your actual Gmail emails or your, um, your calendar or any of those other things. So this third party then can re also revoke that token so that if Yelp goes to use a token after it's been revoked, Gmail can find out that it's been revoked um, and I can also put time limits on it. So that's what um, we start talking about. So that's where we start getting into this scope, lifetime, and other attributes that can be um, restricted by that third party. So the, um, uh, in, an OAuth in an OAuth request, the client requests access to resources controlled by the resource owner and hosted by the resource server, and this is issued a different set of credentials. So um, you know, if I have Yelp and a bunch of other ones here, each one will get a different token. And if I revoke one of those tokens, I don't revoke the other ones. So just that one party loses access. So now you've got more granular control. And that token can also contain information about what's allowed to be accessed at the, um, at the, third, at the, the first party, the Gmail service. So then it, it gives an example here that talks about basically the same things I just did in, in this picture here. So I'm not going to go over that, but it's basically the same thing about sharing um, something about sharing photos with a photo service. So that is, in a nutshell, the, uh, the introduction here. So in the next video, I'll get into roles. And I think the roles are the most important thing to understanding, to being able to read this documentation, because I read this documentation four or five times. Um, and I just didn't get it until I finally really nailed down what the roles were and, and specifically um, one of the roles that can change based on the, the, the security of where that role is. So talk about that in the next video. So that's about it for this video. Um, that, that helps, that's the introduction into why we need, um, why we, we need to, to give this, this different type of access because just throwing passwords around is a, a terrible thing. So again, this is Terry Caliendo, Dedicated Managers, um, throwing out another, another video on a Friday afternoon. Hopefully you took that. Hopefully that was understandable. Again, take everything with a grain of salt that I say. Sometimes I have my mind thinking one thing and I say another thing. Um, I do these videos on a fly. Don't practice them too much, even though this is the third time I've done this video. Um, so just ask, ask any questions if anything's confusing in the comments and don't forget to uh, subscribe to the dedicated managers channel here on youtube.com slash dedicated managers. Click the subscribe button, follow us, um, so that you can get more videos as I come out with more. Um, we'll go through the, this spec and then I'll be doing some more stuff on, on some other projects. Pretty much anytime I come across anything that's confusing on a project and I have to look it up, I, I try to, to write down that I'm to make some videos about it. So again, thanks for following. Hope to see you in the next video. Terry Caliendo, Dedicated Managers, signing out. Have a great day. Happy programming.